Dr. Bob Rothman. He's the chair of the Dawn Unity Group, and he has degrees from both MIT and Northwestern University. He has served as president of Congregation Nertami. He's been the treasurer of the Mary and Joseph Retreat Center, and he's the chair of the Jewish Studies Advisory Board at Loyola Marymount University. He's a dedicated student of history through university classes, reading and teaching classes in religious history. Our second speaker this evening is Reverend Alexi Smith. Reverend Alexi Smith received a Master of Divinity degree from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston, Massachusetts. And he was ordained a Greek Catholic priest of the Eparchy of Newton, Massachusetts. He is pastor of St. Andrew Russian Greek Catholic Church in El Segundo. Father Alexei is the ecumenical and interreligious officer of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. He was appointed to that position by Cardinal Mahoney in 2000. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Father Alexei. Thank you and good evening. It's great to be here once again. I'd like to begin tonight with a prayer. This is the prayer that uh, Pope St. John Paul II placed in the Kotel in the Western Wall in Jerusalem during his historic visit there in March of 2000. That prayer read as follows. God of our fathers, you chose Abraham and his descendants to bring your name to the nations. We are deeply saddened by the behavior of those who in the course of history have caused these children of yours to suffer and asking your forgiveness, we wish to commit ourselves to genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 56, verse 5, we read the following. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name. Monument and a name. I don't have to tell those of you who speak Hebrew. In Hebrew, that is Yad Vashem. Ever been to Yad Vashem? How many of you have been there? Very good. Yad Vashem is the Jewish people's living memorial to the Holocaust, safeguarding the memory of the past and imparting its meaning for future generations. Both multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary it presents the story of the Shoah from the Jewish perspective, emphasizing the experiences of individual victims through original artifacts, survivor testimonies, and personal possessions. I've been there many times. Those of you who are Catholic, if you've made pilgrimages to the Holy Land, I would be willing to bet you did not see this advertised as an option for you to visit, All right? You have not seen this as an option to visit, sadly, sadly. I've been there both as part of official delegations and also as part of a class that I co-teach at Loyola Marymount University, part of the Jewish Studies program there. A few years ago, when we're taking one of the classes there, I warned the students before entering that what they were about to experience would not be easy and would not leave them unmoved. And my warning proved to be true. One young man, kind of a macho guy, left the museum, sat in the courtyard, and cried. And for many of the other students, they sat there silently and reflectively for some time afterward. Sadly, I later learned that this student, this male student I referred to a moment ago, later committed suicide. And the reason he committed suicide was because he had been a skinhead at one time and had the swastika carved into the side of his head and couldn't cope with what he had done and the suffering he had inflicted on people, especially when confronted with what he saw at Yad Vashem. Much of what I share with you this evening and next week uh, will not be easy or pleasant to hear and will certainly not leave you unmoved, but that's the goal. 
of our sessions this evening and next week. On my first visit to Yad Vashem, several years ago now, I was part of an interfaith delegation going to both the Vatican and to Jerusalem. The delegation was composed of Jews, some of our fellow Christians, and myself as a representative of our Archbishop at that time, Cardinal Mahoney, and one very brave Muslim woman who joined us. Some of the artifacts at that uh, exhibit glared at me, particularly some of the photographs of priests and bishops giving the Nazi salute. Another photograph documented a priest standing next to an elderly Jewish woman who was kneeling on the ground, being harangued by a Gestapo agent. The Jewish woman seemed to be looking up forlornly at the priest as if begging him to do something, which apparently he did not. Perhaps the most challenging experience that I encountered at that first visit was when a young docent observed me looking at a section of photographs of Pope Pius XII and reading the captions under those photographs. The docent came up to me, dressed as I am in my ecclesiastical finery here, and he looked at me adversarially in the eyes, and he said, you people and your pope did nothing to help us. And then he continued and proceeded to harangue the Catholic Church. I'll never forget that young man. I tried to be respectful. I tried to listen to him. I tried to offer him some examples of righteous Catholic Gentiles. But he was having nothing of it. He demanded that I, as if I had the power to do so, um, would open the Vatican archives so that in his word, words, the real story of Pius XII's Holocaust collaboration could be made known. Collaboration, I asked. He said, yes, that's our position, and we're sticking to it until you prove ever otherwise. I'll never forget, never forget that young man. Over the years since then, the texts under those photographs have changed somewhat, but we'll look at that next week. This week, I'd like to, pre to present with, with you and share with you an answer to the question, so how did the Catholic Church come to be seen as a collaborator in the Holocaust? Well, initially, the differences between those who believed in Jesus and those who did not follow his teaching involved an argument within Judaism about the right way to read the Torah, the right way to read events, through the lenses of the Torah. Though the rhetoric could be caustic, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, we read, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Words such as that effect. Or the Gospel of John, which is probably the last of the four Gospels written um, and can be quite uh, harsh with the Jews. Though that rhetoric could be caustic, it reflected a passion of a family argument, analogous to controversies that, fell up, that flare up within denominations today. The movement from fraternal twin to rival signals a significant shift in which criticism and polemic moved from the realm of inter-Jewish debate to that of Christian versus Jew. As Gentiles came to predominate among the believers in Jesus, the differentiation moved outside of that family circle, and increasingly the word Christian stood in opposition to Judaism. The critique of Judaism found in the educated elite of Christianity in early antiquity bore the marks of the Greco-Roman polemical style most notably the art of defaming the other, and the perspectives of an insecure religious minority. Christians saw themselves as rivals of the Jews, a polarity that certainly would have seemed strange to Jesus. Why? Because he, of course, was a Jew. The division between these fraternal twins happened neither quickly nor uniformly, Moreover, no single issue can be identified as the cause for the separation between Jews and Christians. 
uh, Rabbi David Klinghoffer, some years ago, wrote a book, Why the Jews Rejected Jesus. I remember being involved in a debate, a debate with him on the campus of American Jewish University. He maintained that the reason why the Jews rejected Jesus was because Jesus didn't advocate following the 613 commandments, only would seem to emphasize 10 of them. We have enough trouble with 10. I can't imagine 613. At least into the mid-2nd century, and in many places well past that, the boundaries between Judaism and Christianity were not so firm as we might have imagined. This seems particularly true amongst the ordinary people, those neither in religious leadership nor among the literary elite. Presumably, the ordinary people had less interest in the theological distinctions being made by their leaders. There's a man by the name of John Gager, G-A-G-E-R, in his article, The Partings of the Ways, A View from Early Christianity, a Christian Perspective. He writes, for many Christians, there was no break at all with Judaism, not in 70 AD, not in 150 AD, not indeed until 370, some 300 years after virtually all previous scholars have told us that the final break took place. I'm not sure that I totally agree with him on that, but the emphasis here is that it wasn't one issue and it wasn't something that was immediate. It was gradual over a long period of time. The division deepened in the third and fourth centuries, certainly. Much of Christian literature in the late second to fifth centuries centered on apologetics, that is, explaining and justifying our beliefs. Christians had, for example, to vindicate their decision to retain the Hebrew scriptures as our Old Testament. There was a, a, a leader named Marcion who had opposed even containing the Jewish scriptures in the Christian Bible. Teachers of an earlier era, such as Barnabas and Justin the philosopher and martyr and Tertullian and Origen argued often vehemently that the Jews misinterpreted the scriptures. They maintained that only Christians rightly read the prophecies. Only Christians worshiped in the true ways. The Jews, blind to God's ways and lacking in faith, were mired in the law. So they were indeed rivals, perceived as rivals. Let's consider some of the writings of the early church fathers. Again, these are not my words. These are the ancient writers of the church, and they're not pleasant to hear. Jews are slayers of the Lord, murderers of the prophets, enemies of God, haters of God, adversaries of grace, enemies of their father's faith. That's in the writings of St. Gregory of Nyssa. Here he's laying the foundation for the accusation of deicide against the Jews. That is, they are the Christ killers. Another quotation, this one from Augustine, the Pippo. The Jews held him, the Jews insulted him, the Jews bound him, they crowned him with thorns, they dishonored him by spitting on him, they scourged him, they heaped abuses on him, they hung him on a tree, they pierced him with a lance. The him there being Jesus, again, the charge of deicide. Again, Augustine. The church admits and avows that the Jewish people to be cursed because after killing Christ, they continue to till the ground of an earthly circumcision, an earthly Sabbath, an earthly Passover. In this way, the Jewish people, like Cain, continue tilling the ground in carnal observance of the law, which does not yield to them its strength because they do not perceive in it the grace of Christ. Here he's laying the foundations for that that teaching of Augustine about the wandering Jew. God had kept the Jews, Augustine argued, alive as a permanent reminder that Christianity had replaced Judaism as the true faith. He argued that the humiliated, defeated Jews showed what would happen to those who reject God's truth, meaning Christianity. Another early writer, St. Cyprian of Carthage, wrote, when a Christian utters the Lord's Prayer, he or she reproaches and condemns the Jews. Those of you who are Christian, did you know that? That when you recite the Lord's Prayer, you are condemning the Jews? 
Well, that's what St. Cyprian taught. Why? Because they not only faithlessly spurned Christ, but they also cruelly slew him, who now cannot call the Lord Father, since the Lord confounds and refutes them, saying, you are born of the devil as your father, and you wish to do the desires of your father? St. John Chrysostom, the golden-tongued preacher of the East, gave eight sermons covering 100, some 100 pages that are an explosive volcano of venom and rage against the Jews, replete with various stereotypes and obscure characters, characterizations. Whatever the reasons for his pathological and theological hatred of all things Jewish, Chrysostom remains a prime example of religious anti-Judaism. 16 centuries after he wrote these eight homilies against the Jews, the Nazis used his writings as their propaganda or in their propaganda against the Jews. Again, I'm going to share just one paragraph, which is far too much probably. The Jewish people were driven by their drunkenness and their plumpness to the ultimate evil. They kicked about. They failed to accept the yoke of Christ, nor did they pull the plow of his teaching. Another prophet hinted at this when he said, Israel is, a, is as obstinate as a stubborn heifer. Although such beasts are unfit for work, they are fit for killing. And he goes on and on. For John Chrysostom, synagogues are evil nests of idolatry and the devil. I don't know how he ever caught the idea about idolatry because those of you who are Jewish know better than those of us who are Christian that you don't have graven image in synagogues. Yet he says they are nests of idolatry. This church father branded a Christian's visit to a synagogue as an act of blasphemy. Well, if that's true, then I must be blaspheming all the time because I've been in many synagogues. And for a Christian to attend a, a Passover Seder would be, in his words, a direct insult to Jesus. Again, with all the respect to Jesus, I must have insulted him, I don't know how many times, at least once at your home. Worst of all, in Christensen's eyes, is a Christian being in the company of a Jew on Easter, the day that, in his words, the Jews slayed Jesus. And he goes on and on. One more. This is from Origen. Origen, one of the original uh, commentators of the scriptures from a Christian point of view, whose writings have come down to us uh, from the early centuries. For the Jews committed the most impious crime of all when they conspired against the Savior of mankind. Therefore, that city where Jesus suffered these indignities had to be utterly destroyed. The Jewish nation had to be overthrown. And God's invitation to blessedness transferred to others, I mean the Christians. So here, he's laying the foundation for that idea of supersessionism. And although a church council never formally defend, or defined supersessionism, it was the teaching of the Catholic Church until the 20th century with the Second Vatican Council, which radically overturned that type of thinking. I'd like then to quote one other church father, a gentleman who I facetiously call my friend, Melito. Melito was Bishop of Sardis, Sardis today is in Turkey. I visited Sardis uh, a few years ago. Sardis had a very large Jewish community dating from at least the third century uh, before the Common Era. And in Melito's time, he died about the year 180, they likely constituted about 10% of the population in that town. They had an impressive synagogue. I walked the beautiful floor of that synagogue is still in existence. I touched some of the ruined walls of that building very interestingly, they have been partially, partially been restored uh, through the efforts of the Wilshire Boulevard Temple here in Los Angeles. And they had a massive gymnasium constructed about the year 17 BCE. Both archaeological and documentary evidence suggest that the Jewish community here was influential. 
In contrast, no evidence suggests that the Christian community held a similar status there. Melito seems to have been preaching to a fledgling Christian community, a group living under the shadow of a venerable and well-established, attractive Jewish community. Melito, however, points a very different picture. Melito's defensiveness arises not only, not only from the fact that Christians lived under the shadow of the Jewish community at Sardis, but he saw Judaism imposing a threat to this minority faith of Christianity simply by existing and especially by flourishing. Judaism, he said, implicitly questioned the central claims of Christianity. I subsequently reacquainted myself with uh, Melito's poetry, recalling his famous servant homily on Passover, where he takes images from the book of Genesis and Exodus and interprets them in the light of, uh, with a Christian lens. And with considerable rhetorical flourish, he lodges this accusation against the Jews. Again, these are not my words. You can find these on any, uh, any book that contains his writings. O oh, wicked Israel, why did you carry out this fresh deed of injustice, bringing new sufferings upon your Lord, your master, your creator, your maker, the one who honored you, who called you Israel? But you were discovered not to be Israel, for you have not seen God or acknowledged the Lord. Bitter for you, the nails which you sharpened. This is now reference to crucifixion. Bitter for you, the tongue which you sharpened. Bitter for you, the false witness which you set up. Bitter for you, the bonds which you prepared. Bitter for you, the whips which you plated. Bitter for you, Judas, whom you rewarded. Bitter for you, Herod, whom you obeyed. Bitter for you, Caiaphas, in whom you trusted. Bitter for you, the gall which you furnished. Bitter for you, the thorns which you gathered. Bitter for you, the hands which you stained with blood. You put to death your Lord in the midst of Jerusalem. And then he asks, and who has been killed? And who is the killer? And he answers his own question. The Jews murdered God. The king of Israel is destroyed by an Israelite hand. Again, here we have the, the charge of deicide. Deicide, that charge which would be hurled with impunity and with dreadful repercussion, repercussions pardon me, for Jews in the Middle Ages and well beyond. This very negative view of the role of Jews in the Passion of Christ is certainly evident in European art as well as in Passion plays, Passion plays which often are uh, presented during the Lenten period in the Christian world. European cathedrals and palaces are known to display a teaching of contempt and a theological denial of Judaism, proclaiming the Jews as the killers of, it of Jesus. In Italy, for example, in the church in Urbino, a woman is shown stealing the host from the, the church, handing it over to a Jewish pawnbroker for its destruction. They're both discovered and burned at the stake. In a classic of Spanish literature, Las Cantigas de Santa Maria, which is a compilation of poetry and music by King Alfonso X of Castile, there are six pictures illustrating a legend about a theft by a Jew under the inspiration of the devil of a picture of the Virgin Mary. A Christian and his wife find the picture, they wash it clean, the couple gives the picture a place of honor in their home, pilgrims come to visit the holy image. Leading up to the Middle Ages, a new pattern of institutional discrimination against the Jews occurred, in which the church was heavily involved. Jews were forbidden to intermarry with Christians. They were prohibited from high positions, holding high positions in the government and prevented from appearing as witnesses against Christians in court. And as Jews were being officially ostracized, certain bizarre fantasies about them arose in Northern Europe that foreshadowed the anti-Semitism of the 20th century. It was alleged, for example, that Jews had horns and tails and engaged in ritual murder of Christians. Why? To make matzah. I've had matzah, and I don't think so. This latter allegation, referred to as the blood libel, was fabricated by a certain man named Thomas of Mammoth 
1150 to explain the mysterious death of a Christian boy, and it reoccurs in English and German myths. In 1095, Pope Urban II made a general appeal to Christians of Europe to take up the cross and sword and liberate the Holy Land from the Muslims, beginning what were to be known as the Crusades. The religious fervor that drove men and, sadly, even children on these Crusades was to have a direct consequence for the Jews. The Crusader armies, which more likely resembled mobs, swept through Jewish communities on the way to the Holy Land and in the Holy Land, looting, raping, massacring the inhabitants. Thus, the idea of program, which Bob is certainly going to talk about, organized the, mass, the organized mass, uh, massacre of Jews was born. And in 1215, at the Fourth Lateran Council of the Catholic Church, declared, that council declared in its canon number 68 these words, and I quote, In some provinces, a difference in dress distinguishes the Jews or Saracens, meaning the Muslims, from Christians. But in certain others, such a confusion has grown up, and they cannot be distinguished by any difference. This, thus it happens at times that through error, Christians have relations with women of Jews or Saracens, and Jews and Saracens with Christian women. Therefore, that they may not, under the pretext of error of this sort, excuse themselves in the future for excesses of such prohibited intercourse, we decree that such Jews and Saracens of both sexes in every Christian province and at all times shall be marked off in the eyes of the public from the other peoples to the character of their dress. In other words, Jews were required to dress differently from Christians. And they had to wear certain kinds of hats. This, of course, is a um, foundation for what? For the, Jewish, the stars that Jews would have to wear during the Nazi area. Another couple of quick examples of, of uh, church art. In the Cathedral of Strasbourg in France, about the year 1230, a statue was uh, installed entitled Ecclesia versus Synagoga. The church, Ecclesia, on the left, is depicted as a crowned young woman with a cross and a chalice. The synagogue, on the right, is a blindfolded woman. Her staff is broken, and she holds the tablets of the law upside down and stained glass from a window of a church in Germany, Werber in Germany, dated 1467. Again, we find the synagogue versus the church. The church is portrayed as a king riding on a lion. And the synagogue is a blindfolded woman, her staff broken, a crown sliding off her head. And in the Liege Book of Psalms from Belgium, Pontius Pilate, you know who Pontius Pilate was, the Roman governor, who condemned Jesus to death, he is depicted as a Jew washing his hands. During the middle of 14th century, certainly the Black Death, the bubonic plague, uh, killed, what, 25 million people? Fear, superstition, ignorance, prompted the the need to blame someone And the Jews were a convenient scapegoat because of the myths and stereotypes that were already believed about them. Although the Jews were also dying from the plague, they were accused of poisoning the wells and spreading the disease. In the year 1290, King Edward I expelled the Jews from England, making England the first European country to do so. Over 200 years later, on the 30th of July, 1492, the Jewish community of Spain, who had lived peacefully in Lane for years, that community was expelled. And by whom? By an edict of their Catholic majesties, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. This is certainly part of the largest Spanish Inquisition, which was carried out in part to convert Jews to Catholicism A considerable number of Jews, men, women, and children, were mistreated or died as a result of the Inquisition. 
And then you have the classic uh, libel again, blood libel um, charges, um, although supported by local clergy, uh, sometimes even bishops. Certain popes did try to counter that idea of the blood libel, but the whole concept of it was widely accepted by the rank and file individuals. Blood libel meaning that Jews would, would kidnap young children, Christian ch your children, or, or even adults, take their blood and use their blood somehow to make matzah, which is a ridiculous uh, charge. What makes all these entirely false accusations against the Jews over the centuries pertinent to our discussion here it is what seems to be a popular level reflex of that ancient canard against the Jews, that Jews were collectively responsible and guilty for the death of Jesus. The deicide charge carried forward over the ages and embroidered, as we've seen by the blood libel charges, and increasingly vindictive passion plays depicting the Jews as being in league with the devil, can truly be said to have paved the way, in my opinion, for the Holocaust. As an author by the men of Ben Zion Bolker puts it so transiently in his book, Judaism and the Christian Predicament, he writes this paragraph. The conception of the Jew as a sinister figure, accentuated by hate to seek the death of Jesus, invited the belief that these characteristics were a permanent trait of the Jew and that he is continually engaged in secret plots against Christendom. The Jews then became frequent targets of charges of all sorts of nefarious activities against their Christian neighbors. Throughout the Middle Ages, one continues to encounter various libels against the Jews, that they poisoned the wells, that they desec desecrated the, the wafer used at the host in the Christian mass, that they slew Christians, especially Christian children, to use their blood for ritual purposes. Torture produced confessions from those accused, and one such libel became evidence for the, pepper, for the perpetration of another libel. In 1545, Martin Luther, who led the, the uh, Protestant Reformation, wrote a pamphlet entitled The Jews and Their Lies, claiming that the Jews thirsted for Christian blood and urged the slaying of Jews. I know that Bob is going to talk more about that. I think he's going to share a quote from that document with you. Did you know that the Nazis reprinted that document in 1935. Some scholars feel that these scurrilous attacks mark the transition from anti-Judaism, meaning uh, opposing the Jews because of their beliefs and practices, to anti-Semitism, which is hatred of the Jews as a race, whose existence would contaminate the purity of other races. Another couple of facts, and then I will be wrapping up my time. Pope Gregory the Ninth, in he died in 1241, pressed the ecclesiastical and secular authorities alike to seize and destroy Jewish books. King Louis the Ninth heeded the order and seized them in 1240. Shortly after that. Copies of the Talmud were condemned and burned in Paris, an action that foreshadowed the Inquisition's condemnation and public burning of the Talmud in Rome in 1553, and much later, of course, Kristallnacht. There are many other foreshadowings that we could discuss, but I think you'll get the picture of what I'm laying out here. I began tonight with a prayer, John Paul II's prayer at the Hotel, the Western Wall, showing where we've come. But I would, I would like to close my section this evening and turn things over to Bob with another prayer showing from whence we came in terms of the church's mentality towards the Jews. With all due respect to you, looking out at the audience, some of you at least will remember the old Good Friday prayers for the Jews. Old prayers pre-Vatican II prayers for the Jews. 
in every Catholic church, every Roman Catholic church, this prayer was said on Good Friday, the day that we commemorate Christ's death, passion and death. Let us pray also for the Jews, that the Lord our God may take the veil from their hearts, and that they may also acknowledge our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray, almighty and everlasting God, you do not refuse your mercy even to the Jews. Hear the prayers which you offer for the blindness of that people, so that they may acknowledge the light of your truth and be delivered from their darkness. Thanks be to God, we've expunded that type of prayer from our liturgy on Good Friday. But let me then close with a story about how that, that expunging took place. Shortly after Pope, now Saint John XXIII, was elected to the papacy, he was going to be presiding at his first Good Friday service in the Vatican at the St. Peter's as Pope. And so he go, goes into the sacristy. This was told to me by a Monsignor who has uh, connections at the Vatican. He goes into the sacristy. The sacristy is the room where priests vest and prepare for the service. He asks the uh, master of ceremonies to bring the text of the service to him. So he brings the text over to him. And then he does something very unusual. He asks for a pen. And the Monsignor gets very nervous. What does he want a pen for? So he takes the pen out and he flips through the service until he comes to the prayer I just shared with you. And there he takes his pen and he crosses it out and merely says the Italian word basta, which means enough. Enough of this mentality, enough of this approach to our, our brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith. And although I've shared with you some very horrible things tonight, I hope next week to end on a more positive note. Thanks for having me. Anti-Semitism to me is a very personal issue uh, because at each time you find it could have been me. Jews were persecuted, not because of their character, not because of their deeds, not because of their appearance, but because they were Jews. I'm a Jew. It could have been me. Uh, and I have family links, as many American Jews do. My paternal grandfather grew up in Kiev and he was sent forth to the U.S. to earn money for the rest of the family to come. And he found out that the rest of the family had been killed in a pogrom. My maternal grandfather, <coughs> excuse me, was born and raised in Bialystok, Poland, one of eight children. He and one brother came to the U.S. One sister went to Stockholm. The rest were murdered. Unlike most Jews, I grew up in a small town near the buckle of the Bible Belt, Rome, Georgia. I was called a Christ killer when I was too young to know what either word meant, much less the combination. But the good thing about it is living in that kind of environment, you learn to separate out the good people from the rest. So I'm, I'm going to go through European history tonight, and then next week we'll do American history. There was no place for the Jews in feudal Europe. Forbidden to own land or belong to craftsmen guilds, refused citizenship, unable to be men at arms because knights were soldiers of Christ, unable to be lawyers, physicians, and other professional educated people because the universities were closed to them. Public service was forbidden to Jews. As Father Alexei mentioned, the Fourth Lateran Council, uh, it says that Jews be given preference 
in public office since this office, since this offers them the opportunity to vent their wrath against the Christians, it would be too absurd for a blasphemer of Christ to exercise power over Christians. So some turned to money lending, which was forbidden to Christians, unless you were really big like the Medici's or somebody like that, it was okay. And the Jews were able to do this because and they were also good at, at trade because they had family members and relations of various kinds in other cities in Europe and the Middle East because they spoke a common language, because they used the Arabic number system when the rest of Europe was still on Roman numerals, and because they had their own set of laws which were enforced within the community, which then gave trust to people from outside because they saw the results of it. The first vicious attacks occurred when the Crusades began, as Father Alexei said. Uh, 1095, the Council of Claremont, Pope Urban II called for the Crusade to free the Holy Land from the Muslims. Well, so the people figured, as long as they're being organized, why not take care of other infidels who live right amongst you, who look different, wear different clothes, are made to be separate and made to be unequal to the rest of us. Why not pick on them? So the first exercise was at Rouen, where the Jews were herded into a church those who refused baptism were killed. And this was the beginning of things to come. The Rhine Valley had been a home for Jews since Roman times. And they were made to choose between conversion or death. Pogroms began in Speer in 1096. Worms, where 500 were killed. Mainz, where 130 were killed. Cologne, Metz, and Regensburg. At Trier, the Jews sought refuge from the bishop's palace, but he told them, Wretches, your sins have come upon you. Ye who have blasphemed the Son of God and disrespected his mother, this is the cause of your miseries. Further pogroms occurred at Bapard, 1179 Vienna, 1181 Speer, 1185 All, 1205 Erfurt, 1212 Mecklenburg, 1225 Fuchen, 1226 Frankfurt, 1241 Bielitz, 1243 Forsheim, 1244 Wurzburg, 1293 Nuremberg, 1293 Alsace, 1336 Bavaria, 1337, Bohemia, 1337, and Moravia. The Jews in large numbers chose death over baptism because it was what is called the Kadosh Hashem, the sanctification in the name of God. There's an old story among Jews. There's a Jewish musician's tend to pick the violin because it's the small instrument and it's easily transportable when you have to move. And they had to move. From 1012 to 1791, 33 expulsion orders were given to Jews by cities and states of Europe. It was to scapegoat the Jews, strengthen alliances with religious leaders, gain favor with the people, and financial benefits of canceling debts and stealing their property. It's a long list of expulsions. 1012 mines, 
1121 Flanders, 1276 Bavaria, 1182 Paris, 1254 France by Louis IX, 1306 France by Philip IV, 1322 France by Charles IV, 1288 Naples, 1290 England, 1294 Bern, 1390 Hungary, 1394, France by Charles VI, 1478 from Passau, 1491 from Ravenna, 1492 from Spain, 1493 from Sicily, 1496 from Portugal, 1510 from Brandenburg, 1540 from Naples, 1519 from Regensburg, 1526 from Bratislava, 1554 from Calabria, 1569 from the Papal States, 1597 from Milan, 1614 from Frankfurt, 1669 from Vienna. And then 1791, Catherine the Great enforced the Pale of Settlement, uh, keeping the Polish Jews from moving to Russia. The plague killed a third of the population of Europe in the middle of the 14th century. And of course, as we have found throughout history, blame the Jews. And in this case, an answer was found. A tortured Jew in Shalon named Vala Balavingas, under torture, gave them the lethal portion, which made them very satisfied. Frogs, spiders, lizards, human flesh, the hearts of Christians, and of course the ultimate abomination, consecrated hosts, all boiled down and ground to a lethal powder. That was the cause. The ghetto was a restricted district within which Jews were required to live. The word ghetto comes from the Italian word for foundry because the first ghetto was in Venice and it was in an area, a very dirty industrial area that uh, had been a foundry in uh, 1516. In 1555, Pope Paul IV published a decree ordering all Jews to be segregated in their own quarters, forbidden to go out at night, barred from all but the meanest occupations, and forced to wear a distinctive yellow hat. Ghettos were Florence, Rome, Venice, throughout Italy, Germany, France, Austria, Croatia, Poland, Spain, Russia, Lithuania, Belarus, Czech Republic, and Hungary. One of the causes of persecution of the Jews was competition among the orders of friars. There are three ways to compete for power and importance to the Pope. Piety, missionary work and conversion, rooting out heresy. Jews were a convenient focus of conversion and heresy. Pope Innocent III commissioned two new orders, the Dominicans and the Franciscans, to carry out conversions. Both orders were directed to preach to Jews who were easily identified and lived among them. King James I of Aragon issued the following order in 1242. We wish and decree that whenever the bishops or archbishops or Dominican or Franciscan friars visit a town where Saracens or Jews dwell and wish to present the word of God to said Jews or Saracens, they must gather at their call and must patiently hear the preaching. If they do not wish to come of their own free will, our officials shall compel them to do so, putting aside all excuses. 
In 1236, Pope Gregory appointed the Franciscans and the Dominicans as inquisitors. As official inquisitors, they were authorized to use torture to extract confessions as approved by Pope Innocent IV in 1252. The Franciscans had uh, gone a long way from their founder, St. Francis of Assisi, in doing this work. There was one problem in calling the Jews heretics, as Father Alexei had alluded to earlier. They had the Bible, the same Bible as the Christian Bible. And so you can't find the heresy there because that's a Christian document is also. So where does it happen? It comes from the Talmud, which is entirely Jewish. Let me explain. Uh, the Torah, or the five books of Moses, are the written law. The Talmud is a collection of interpretations and explanations and detail derived over centuries of discussion among the rabbis. I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the Torah may say, drive safely on the streets. Talmud would introduce traffic lights, stop signs, lanes, speed limits. This is the difference between the written law and, and the, the Talmud. So we're going to blame the Talmud because that's a Jewish document. Uh, June 14, 1244, 24 wagon loads of Jewish religious manuscripts, 10,000 volumes were set on fire in the streets of Paris. Christianity versus Judaism was a subject of debates called dispositions in which a rabbi debated a Christian theologian who was typically a converted Jew, so he knew the Jewish text. And this was a very public ceremony the rabbi had to be very careful. He could not attack Christianity because that would endanger the safety of the Jews of town. So it was a difficult position to be in, and the Christians always won. Notable dispositions, Paris, 1240, Barcelona, 1263, Pamplona, 1375, Tortosa, 1413, all to prove that Judaism was flawed. Spain was a very interesting place. Uh, you know, the, the Muslims crossed over the Strait of Gibraltar in uh, 711 and occupied the Iberian Peninsula. They pushed further and were pushed back by Charles Martel. And so they stayed in Spain, actually, for uh, 760 years. Time flies. The Jews in Spain fared well under the Muslim leadership, much better than under Visigoth Spain. And they were allowed to uh, do whatever. There was no prohibition against what the Jews did in this place. And th those 300 years when the Muslims were overseers and there were significant numbers of each of the three faiths living together in peace and productive harmony called the Convivienza, the only time in history this has ever happened. It was a remarkable time. This happened while the rest of Europe was living in the Dark Ages. And this combination of Muslims and Jews carried forth the wisdom of the Greeks and the wisdom of the Arabs and, and introduced it to Christian Europe, which is where they got it. Jews were physicians, financiers, and statesmen. Contributions of the Muslims in astronomy, medicine, architecture, and mathematics 
And as I said, the writings of Greek philosophers came to Europe through the Jews and Muslims in Spain. Well, that came to an end because the sophisticated Umayyads who were a, a Muslim family headquartered in Damascus and there they fell into decline. Uh, the Berbers of Northern Africa took over Spain. The Berbers were the Taliban of their time. And so all of this education and, 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 and living, to, it all disappeared into a, a more difficult period of time. And there was those who could got out. The, the philosopher Maimonides left Spain at that time and went to Cairo, where he became the physician to the caliph. Well, Spain was conquered, the Reconquista, the Christian armies came through, finally uh, ending up, uh, the last place was Granada, 1492, and then it was entirely Christian. Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabel of Castile issued what they called the Alhambra Degree ordered the expulsion of Jews in 1492 from Spain. Some went to Portugal. Ferdinand and Isabella's daughter was the requested bride of the king of Portugal, and they told him, not unless you get rid of your Jews can you have my daughter as your wife. So... So much for, for, for Portugal. The Sultan Bavese, excuse me, said of Ferdinand's expulsion of the Jews, how can you call such a king wise and intelligent? He is making his country poorer and enriching my kingdom. Expelled Jews were welcomed in Istanbul, the Netherlands, Italy, particularly the trading cities of Venice and Genoa, Rome, and in North Africa. The Jews of Spain had choices that the Jews of the Rhine had, did not have 300 years earlier. The Jews of Spain could leave or they could take conversion. If they took conversion, there were two choices. You can forget about Judaism or you can practice it quietly in your own home. These people were called Maranos, who were outwardly Christian, but Jewish to the core. Well, the Spanish Inquisition had been established in 1478. And they went about trying to forcibly convert the Jews. And there were a number of Jews who accepted this as opposed to the Rhine where they accepted death rather than conversion. And the Spanish did something different. Up to that time, if you converted you were a Christian. Not so in Spain. Spain came up with what they called limpieza sangre, the, the blood, the royal blood. And you had to have Christian blood. If you had any Jewish blood in you, you could not convert. You were not recognized as a Christian. Why did they do this in Spain? Because the Spanish Jews had been educated people, successful, uh, responsible people, and so the, the Spaniards took their livelihood away from them. The Moranos were sought out by the Spanish Inquisition. They were the first auto de fe act of faith occurred in Seville, 
in 1481, six men and women were publicly burned at the stake. Auto de fe's became frequent public spectacles. 37 signs by which one could recognize Jews were published. And Spanish cuisine is interesting too because I'm a, a, a fool around kind of cook person. Spanish cuisine adds forbidden foods of pork and shellfish to all kinds of dishes that no other cuisine in Europe does. This was to see if a Jew would eat it. If they didn't eat it, aha, call the inquisitors. All in all, 400,000 persons were tried by the Inquisition, and at least 30,000 were executed. In the 350 years of the Inquisition's existence, it was extended to Mexico and Spanish South America, where it continued its dirty work. Its terror officially ended in 1834. The Alhambra decree, issued in 1492 that had expelled the Jews from Spain, was formally rescinded on December 16, 1968. Well, since Father Alexei promised you some Martin Luther quotes, let me do this. Uh, in the book, what he mentioned, Jews and their lies. First, their synagogues or churches should be set on fire. Second, their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed. Thirdly, they should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmud. Fourth, their rabbis must be forbidden under threat of death to teach anymore. Fifth, Traveling privileges should be absolutely forbidden to Jews. Let them stay at home. Sixth, they ought to be stopped from usury. Seventh, let the strong Jews and Jewesses be given the flail, the ax, the spade, and let them earn their bread. In the middle of the 17th century in Crimea, in 1648, there was a group of people, the Corsian Cossacks, and they had a leader named Bogdan Shmilnitki. He hated the Jews and murdered over 100,000. It's still regarded as one of the blackest times in Jewish history, but he was a hero of the Ukrainian people and the father of Ukrainian nationalism, and there are statues in, to him throughout Ukraine. And Ukraine's a funny thing with Jews. In, in one of the most terrible massacres of the Nazi period, Babi Yar, uh, 33,771, they counted them, they counted 33,771 Jews were killed by Ukraine police under Nazi supervision. Today, Ukraine has a Jewish president. I don't know. The world is mysterious. The 18th century brought anti-Semitism into the dialogue of the leading European intellectuals. Frederick the Great of Prussia, who took great pride in being known as the philosopher king despised Jews, and his 1750 book, General Privilege, was filled with the medieval spirit of intolerance. He gave protection to some, but tried to limit the Jews under his control. Voltaire spent his entire life fighting existing abuses and superstition, yet this enemy of injustice attacked the Jews as Quote, in short, we find in them only an ignorant and barbarous people who have long united the most 
sordid avarice with the most detestable superstition and the most invincible hatred for every people by whom they are tolerated and enriched. Man likes hyperboles, doesn't he? Goethe looked upon the Jews as inferior and degraded. Jews were disinherited politically, restricted economically, and despised socially. The theory was that a Christian state was an integral part of the day's political philosophy. As late as 1824, the Archbishop of Canterbury said in the House of Lords, in opposing a bill to allow Jews to sit in Parliament, quote, that the blessings of the divine providence had been bestowed upon the country as a Christian country, and we should be apprehensive lest these blessings should be withdrawn when the country ceased to retain that character. The French Revolution, the Declaration of Human Rights, made Jews equal citizens. Russia, of course, was difficult, always bad. Uh, Anti-Semitism was as old as Russia itself. The various czars, the Romanovs were notorious anti-Semites. Uh, perhaps as a religious thing or perhaps as a scapegoat. Tyrants do like scapegoats. A million Jews were living in Poland in 1772 when Russia began to annex the country in three partitions. So these Jews officially became part of the Russian Empire. Catherine the Great established what was called the Pale of Settlement, which drew a line that pro prohibited the Jews from coming into Mother Russia. They could stay in Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine. So in Russia, which is where the word pogrom originated, they varied in cruelty. From the incident in Fiddler on the Roof, where the Cossacks come in and break up the wedding and break up the, the Jewish community, to much more vicious kinds where people were killed. After the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, there was a blame the Jews, tragically. So, so Jews in southwest Russia and Ukraine were attacked, with Kiev and Odessa being the worst. 1903 to 1906, there were pogroms in 64 towns. This resulted in the large wave of Russian Jews immigrating to the U.S. where they came to the land of gold. The 19th century brought changes that magnified anti-Semitism. There was the rise in nationalism. Germany became a nation. Italy became a nation. The Balkans were uh, removed from the control of the Turks and nationalism engendered hatred of minorities as a consequence of the cult of the patriotism. In such an atmosphere, Jews were unable to find peace as they were looked upon as an alien group, stubborn and unassimilable. They spoke the language, were active in political, economic, and intellectual life, and gave their blood for their country, yet the nationalists did not trust them. The triumph of the middle class fueled anti-Semitism further, and terms which we have heard in this country, Jewish capitalism, Jewish press, came to life.
France in the late 18th, 19th century, there was an anti-Jewish movement in the politics. Uh, Edward Drummond published his two-volume Jewish France in 1886, a collection of rumors, myths, insinuations to prove Jews were peculiar and so different from all other beings. It was not the first anti-Jewish French book, but it was the first one to sell over 100,000 copies and go through 25 printings. In 1894 in Paris, a maid in the German embassy in Paris, who was actually a, a French spy, was cleaning out a trash can and found a crumpled list which she took back to the French general staff, which listed a number of documents offered for sale. It was an anonymous letter, so the French general staff said about who did this and what. Well, there was one Jew in the French general staff, Captain Alfred Dreyfus, based on some very poor handwriting analysis and some very poor detective work, they said, he is the spy. They had a closed court-martial, introduced secret evidence that nobody else could see, not even the defense, introduced art, uh, uh, falsely written documents, and as a result, found Alfred Dreyfus guilty of spying and sentenced him to life imprisonment at Devil's Island. After he was gone, there was a man named Picard. Colonel George Picard was the head of counter-espionage. He found proof of Dreyfus's innocence. The real culprit was a major Esterhazy who needed money to support his lavish lifestyle. He turned the evidence into his superiors and was asked, what does it matter to you if this Jew stays in Devil's Island? He was warned to be silent, immediately sentenced to a foreign post. The general staff made it a matter of the honor of the French army that Dreyfus remained guilty. Some of the Parisian intellectuals got into the fight. Uh, George Clemenceau, who became prime minister later, uh, and uh, Emile Zola were two of the leaders. Zola wrote the famous I Accuse newspaper, which was published on January 13, 1898, accusing various people in the French general staff of forgeries, of lying, of perjuries. This resulted in a retrial for Dreyfus where he was found guilty again, but the sentence was, was dropped. Back to the first one, Dreyfus was publicly disgraced before being sent to Devil's Island. It was one of those things where his insignias were ripped off, his sword was broken, he was made to parade in front of the, the French army based at the, the, the army college. There was a man watching this. The people were yelling out, death to Dreyfus, death to the Jews. It was a man named Theodore Herzl, who was a Jewish journalist, who was standing outside watching the spectacle, and he became convinced Jews were not safe in Europe. Theodor Herzl is the founder of Zionism. This is where it originated. How are we doing? Well, I'm going skip some of the nastier things about German anti-Semitism during the time and, and just, I think I need to go 
we, we, I'm sorry, we need to end up tonight with the Holocaust. And words cannot begin to address the Holocaust. I wouldn't even try. What I would ask of you, if you are of sympathetic, if you're of interest, if you want to think through this kind of thing, in your privacy of your own home, think of how many people have to be involved to identify, round up, transport, document, and murder six million human beings, plus several million uh, who were not Jews. When you start thinking, and I do, it gets very, very upsetting at all these people that were involved in this mission. The final pogrom happened July the 14th, sorry, July the 4th, 1946. 1946, after victory in Europe, in a town called Kielce in Poland, it was a young boy, eight years old, who was missing from home for two days. It turned out he had been staying with another boy at a, a village nearby, Kielce, came home unharmed, is walking out with his father, and he says, that's the house they held me in. And it was a man standing out front. He says, that's the man who captured me. The father got the Kelsey police, got the workers from a, an iron foundry in Kelsey. They went in and shot four. They were all Jews inside there. They shot four of them and bludgeoned 22 of them to death. 1946 in Poland. The American ambassador demanded the Polish Cardinal Lund issue a public statement on the position of the church, and he attributed it not to racial causes, but to rumors concerning the killing of Polish children by Jews. Lund put the blame for the, on the deterioration in Polish-Jews relations on collaboration with the Soviet backers, communist occupiers, Jewish occupiers, leading positions in Polish life. Sorry everything is so black, but it is, and that's what we have to do. Next week, it's not as murderous. We'll be talking, I'll be talking about American anti-Semitism. Uh, there are not pogroms here, it's more subtle but it's, it's prominent and we need to talk about it. So next week, I'll start with uh, Peter Stuyvesant in New Amsterdam and bring you up to the present. Thank you.